Okay, so um, welcome everybody. My name is Joe Zipfel. I'm the Regional Ed Tech Coordinator uh, for Southern Illinois for the Learning Technology Center of Illinois. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, creating accessible digital content, how you can take your digital content, whether that be your curricular content or presentations, uh, and make it accessible to all students. Um, before we get into that, please uh, let me just take a moment um, to tell you that I am a source uh, of, of, I'm a resource for you and a, and a great source of information if you need it uh, and support. Um, it's literally my job to support Illinois teachers. So if you need any sort of guidance, any sort of information, if you have questions after our session today, please feel free to reach out. You can shoot me an email. You can follow me uh, on Twitter at LTC Joe C. Um, but I'm here for you. Uh, and again, please feel free to reach out. Now, secondly, you're going to definitely want to keep the slide deck that's being shared today um, for a reference. There will be lots of great resources, um, and there are links on the slide deck that you'll want to take a look at after the webinar today. So uh, please, please uh, hold on to that uh, slide deck. It will be active and available to you indefinitely after the session today. Um, so again, please consider it a, a resource. Okay, so um, before uh, we get started in on the presentation, what I would like you to do is take a look on slide number three, if you're in the slide deck right now, uh, and there is a link um, to a Jamboard. Um, and really, it's just a Jamboard where we're generating and crowdsourcing ideas. You're going to need it later. Um, but again, um, it is something you can check out uh, after the session today, uh, and it's going to be a great source of resources uh, for uh, all of the webinars and workshops that I give on this topic. Okay, so let's talk about um, accessibility of your digital content. And we should always, always start with the why. Uh, why do we need to do this? And it is literally a matter of equity. So uh, from the source, what does ISTE have to say about this? Well, there are um, um, the ISTE standards to take a look at. So we can talk about uh, equitable access uh, of ed tech information uh, and those emerging technologies. So we need to take a look at digital resources and make sure that those digital resources um, can meet the learning uh, and teaching goals of all our learners. So we truly have the power. So we teachers have, we, we, we yield a great power and that power is to curate how and when and where and what our students learn. So we need to choose wisely and we need to make sure that we're choosing a digital content um, uh, that is accessible to all of our learners. So we can take a cue from the Universal Design of Learning, UDL. Um, and if you are at all familiar with the UDL framework, um, it recognizes that all students learn differently. And the aim of UDL is to reduce all of those kinds of physical and cognitive, uh, organizational, executive kind of barriers uh, to learning that vary with each student. Again, if you are looking to rewrite any of your curriculum, or if you are adding digital curriculum to your existing content, take a look at UDL and, and maybe um, uh, design your curriculum using that UDL framework. It is an excellent framework and there's so much great information out there on UDL. <clears throat> so what can you do today, absolutely right now, to make your digital learning materials accessible? Well, there are four simple things that you can start with right off the bat before I give you any sort of information. First of all, would be to create alt text for your images. So if you have any students at all with visual impairments um, that are using a screen reader, you're going to want to put alt text in for any image that's on the screen. So that if that student is using a screen reader, um, 
they can get a a an audible description of what that picture is using that screen reader. And so creating alt text for your images is literally as difficult as just right clicking over the image and adding alt text. And when you're creating alt text, you want to tell the viewer what that is an image of. Secondly, caption your videos. If you're making any videos for your students, uh, make sure that you have captions on. Now, this is not only great for your students who have hearing impairments uh, or any sort of hard of hearing or deaf issues. Um, it's going to be good for all of your students. Putting captions on your videos and your digital content um, can certainly make it more accessible, but even for your um, your typical students, those are going to be great opportunities for them. All of the TVs in my house have the captions on because I like to read that dialogue for sure. And uh, an application like Google Slides has captioning built in, just has voice recognition captioning built in. So if you're creating a video using a slide deck, you can turn on the voice recognition captioning while you're making that recording uh, and you've got live action captions. Um, next, uh, if you're creating any podcasts, if you're creating any um, uh, recordings for your students, just audio recordings for your students, you want to make sure that you transcribe those. Um, so anything that's audio only, um, you're going to certainly want to make sure that you have a transcription of that a text uh, so that any students with those hearing impairments can have a copy of that uh, information. Uh, and then lastly, make sure that your website, whether that be a classroom website or whether that be your school district website, um, is ADA compliant. And so um, there are there's a link that I have right here on slide number eight to those ADA guidelines and how um, to structure your website to meet those guidelines. And then lastly, number five, make sure that you're using the right digital tools. And I'm going to provide for you lots of great resources uh, for some excellent digital tools that will improve the accessibility of your content. Um, but speaking of those tools, what I want you to do is if you're in that Jamboard at all, just click on that link up on uh, uh, the previous slide, number three, uh, go to that Jamboard and add a sticky note. And I put a second frame uh, on the, the Jamboard in case you need a second frame, but grab a sticky note and tell us what are some of the digital tools you're currently using um, to improve the accessibility of your digital content? Um, we're just going to simply crowdsource great tools. And I just want to get a nice big master list uh, on, um, on that Jamboard. And I have, there's already uh, a frame that's completed that I've done at a previous session. Okay, last thing here on this slide. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, I've got a link to a great ISTE Ignite talk. And that is a great little 15-minute talk uh, from a lady named uh, Rihanna Gutierrez. And Rihanna is a, uh, is a deaf teacher. Um, so she it talks about how important accessibility is from her own perspective. So not only is she a teacher, but she is hearing impaired as well. And she talks about the impact that that had on her creating digital content that's more accessible to her students. It's a great little motivational 15 minute talk um, that's definitely worth viewing. So check that out there on slide number eight. Okay, now speaking of accessibility in Illinois, we have a new law um, and that is Public Act 102-0238. There's a link to that language right there. Um, so if you want to take a look at that law in detail, there's a link to the Illinois General Assembly website um, to tell you uh, how uh, that law works. But basically what it requires is that any websites or online curriculum that school districts are using needs to be accessible to students with disabilities and must comply with the W3C web content accessibility guidelines. 
Um, so what are the WC3 Web Content Accessibility Guidelines? I'm about to show you that. Um, this law officially took place, um, or took effect, I'm sorry, uh, on August 1st of this year. So these are structures that you really should already have in place. So if we go to the next slide, uh, on slide number 10, there's a link to the introduction to web accessibility, and this will take you to the W3C um, consortium. So the W3C consortium is the World Wide Web Consortium, and they are the standard bearer when it comes to web accessibility. So they run the web accessibility initiative, and you can take a look through this website and go through the guidelines, and it will give you step-by-step -step instructions uh, on how to make your content um, um, compliant with those guidelines. Now, not only that, and let me bounce back to our uh, slide deck here, but not only that, but um, it is the digital content that you're using with your students too. So if you're using a digital textbook series, if you're using tools like Edpuzzle, if you're using um, uh, CK12, for example, I'm a, I am love, love, love CK12 so much. Um, if you're using any of those tools, so any of the digital tools that your district is using must have that accessibility component as well. So um, most of those companies um, will advertise and will list their products as um, W3C compliant. Um, so always just check in to the vendors and the tools and the apps that your are uh, staff is using as well. Okay. <clears throat> so if you take a look within those web accessibility guidelines, there is a great set, there's a great framework, a great set of rules um, that you should follow when developing curricular content from scratch. So if you're creating curricular content, if you're creating presentations for your class, um, if you're writing um, curriculum that has a very heavy tech integration, you can follow what's known as the poor principles. Now, the poor principles were developed by the W3C, and they go right along with those accessibility guidelines. Um, so if you're creating your content, your digital content, using these principles, you are in really good shape and you are making that content accessible to all of your students. So the POUR principle, it's an acronym, P-O-U-R. Um, basically, they are four overarching principles that provide that framework for you to develop and implement digital curriculum uh, and really any curriculum for that matter. And so the P is perceivable, O, operable, um, U is understandable, um, and the R is robust. So let's take a look at those individually. So when you are creating perceivable content, um, you need to make sure um, that the information is presented to at least one of the senses. So that can use images, that can be the use of color, um, and the structuring of content. Um, make sure that you have alternate text descriptions provided. So if you're using a heavily um, image rich content, you must make sure that that alternate text description, those alt text tags have been assigned to those images. And really it's just a matter of right clicking over the image. Um, and I can, I can show you here on our next slide exactly, or let me bounce up to another slide. So if I'm here in this image and I right click over it, you can see that I've got the option right there, alt text, and then I can type in the alternative text to describe that picture to anybody using a screen reader. Um, for uh, people with uh, hearing disabilities or, or deafness, um, the content should be captioned. So if you're, again, if you're creating um, uh, videos, make sure to caption that information. Um, so I've got some lists of best practices there. So um, just the use of check uh, boxes or radio buttons um, is super, super useful. Um, 
if an image serves as a link, make sure that you've got a text description um, for that purpose. Um, lots of times I will bury links on images on my slide decks, and I'll sometimes fail to put some text there that says this image is a link. And so people don't realize that's a link. That is a lack of uh, creating um, a, a good perceptible kind of uh, presentation. Um, and you also want to uh, make sure that you're using comfortable backgrounds. Um, so sometimes a really white background or a really black background um, can um, um, affect students um, with visual impairments or students with a uh, uh, with neurological disorders such as dyslexia, where it's a visual neurological issue. Um, so always think about those background colors as well. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to operable. So um, next, let me move this up a little bit so I can see it on my end. Um, so um, your students need to be able to operate their way through the digital content. Um, so the stuff has to work. Uh, the buttons that they click needs to work. Uh, if they're submitting an answer, they should be able to navigate to the next question. Um, and you want to make sure that students can navigate your content without a mouse or a trackpad. Um, so the students uh, that maybe don't have those dexterity, um, uh, um, those fine motor skills and that dexterity don't necessarily function well with a trackpad or a mouse. So they should be able to arrow up and down and side to side through the content. Um, <clears throat> when you're dealing with best practices on that front, just make sure that you have consistent navigation through your content um, and that the buttons are visible, they're large enough to be seen, um, and they work. Um, and also, what's really great to do is provide progress indicators as students are progressing through digital material if there are tight completion times, if it's a timed test or something like that. Um, Google Forms is a great example of this. Um, if I was giving my students uh, a digital assessment using Google Forms where time was of the essence, I would certainly put the progress check at the bottom of the page. You can simply just check mark a box. It puts a progress monitor, you know, a percentage completed um, um, scale at the bottom of that page so students can definitely track their own progress. Okay, moving on. Um, we're going to go to understandable next. So, um, you need to make sure that your content is understandable for all of your learners. So avoid things like jargon. Make sure that your content is comprehensible. Um, and words are the words that are likely to be unfamiliar to your students are explained in the content. Um, so some best practices on the understandable portion. Um, you want to avoid the all caps kind of spelling or italics. Um, avoid using a huge amount of text effects like shadow or glow around the text. That makes students, uh, that makes that, that content um, hard to understand or hard to read if students have any sort of visual impairment um, or any sort of uh, neurological issue. So um, those are great sometimes for titles, but not necessarily for the main part of the text. Um, you want to uh, avoid things like click here or select. You want to um, want to make sure that you don't want to have instructions where the learners need to interact solely based on color. Um, remember, some students are going to uh, have difficulty seeing color, so don't make the decision that they need to make within the content solely based on color. Make sure that there's text back there uh, to back it up. Uh, make sure that if you have the, if you want the students to click in a certain area, you don't just put click here. You explain what the link is going to do or what it does, right? Um, avoid acronyms and abbreviations, um, and 
separate when you're separating your content into paragraphs keep it at a maximum of about four or five lines at the most and make sure that your uh, key points are right at the start of that paragraph and then just like we I just said uh, you avoid those generic phrases like click here explain with accuracy what's going to happen when the student clicks uh, and so again um, I must admit though I'm guilty of these things. Um, I, when I was preparing all of this, and when I was doing this research on creating accessible content, I went back and I looked through my digital content and I realized there were so many little rules that I was breaking, but not breaking, but just not being aware of. Um, and so I've gone back and tweaked lots of my digital content and lots of my presentations um, because as I was doing this re research, I realized that there were some parts of my own content that weren't accessible to everybody reading it. Okay, moving on. We're going to go to the last one. R is for robust. Um, you just need to make sure that you've got a good, strong digital curriculum. Um, so um, it needs to complement your, the, the digital resources need to complement your curriculum effectively. Um, and everything needs to be able to work without glitches. Um, so again, um, run your content through some assistive technologies first before you give it to your students. So you can take your digital content and run it through the JAWS screen reader, which is just a web-based screen reader, and see if it makes sense prior to giving it to your students. Um, it, it just would be so detrimental to learning if you were giving content to your students and then a screen reader was reading things incorrectly. Um, so that's just things that you have to go back and fix later. So make sure it's working before you distribute it to those students. Um, consider adding PDF documents um, uh, to your students that struggle with navigating their way through um, content. Um, so remember, you can always convert anything on your screen to a PDF by just simply going up to clicking on file and going to print. And there is a save as PDF option in every print screen, no matter what app or tool that you're using. So if you're on a website and you have students that have difficulty navigating their way through that website, you can save that content as a PDF by just simply going to file and print and save as PDF. And then you've got PDFs that you could literally print up if you wanted to and hand it to those students. So um, there is always a great option uh, for that as well. So again, you just wanna make sure that your digital contact works and that it works before you distribute it to your students. Yeah, Matt, that's absolutely correct to, to uh, the, the saving as a PDF to distribute to those students that may have limited internet access at home, for sure. Okay, so now moving on from the POOR principle, let's next talk about creating accessible presentations. So you guys are all teachers. I'm sure you never create presentations that you give to your students. You don't do that on a daily basis, do you? Um, so let's talk about how you can make those presentations more accessible to your students. So we're going to be just talking about creating, you know, slideshows and slide decks um, and, and how you can tweak them just a little bit to benefit all of your students. Um, so let's talk about what an accessible presentation is. An accessible presentation just isn't one that deaf people can hear or that blind people can see. Uh, it isn't just alt text and subtitles and captions. Um, it's a presentation your audience can follow and understand. So it's not just those tweaks for, for those people with, with limitations or disabilities. It's to make it easy to follow and understand for everybody. So let's talk about the golden rules. So I've got for you the five golden rules for accessible presentations. 
Um, now, I'd love to, to claim this as my own, but it was not. It was developed by uh, Dr. Richard Meyer. Um, he is at the University of California. Uh, he's a well-known um, uh, psychologist and an educational researcher, um, and this comes from his uh, research and is just so good. Um, I love these rules so much, and they might shock you, and you're probably breaking a couple of these for sure. Okay, so let's talk about golden rule number one. So very first and foremost, keep it simple. Um, those presentations need to be clean and consistent, and they need to support the topic or the story or the concept that you're covering. You want to avoid white noise. Um, I taught seventh graders for 21 years, and so I had my seventh graders create presentations all the time, and when they were creating slide decks, there was so much white noise. They wanted to put an animation on every single word. They wanted the uh, animations that fly in on the screen. Um, they wanted to put that typewriter sound effect on every letter that came into the screen. Um, and again, that is so distracting. So when I was working with my students, I would always talk about um, the key thing here is to keep the viewer on your side and not to annoy them. So again, uh, creating um, um, distraction-free presentations, um, creating them free from extraneous information um, uh, is important. So what counts as extraneous? What's extraneous? Animations, transitions, templates. Um, if you're just putting things in your presentation just for the sake of it, and it gets in the way of your story, it gets in the way of your topic or concept, then don't use it or use it very sparingly, if at all. Um, truthfully, I put no animations and transitions between my slides, really. Uh, or if there is an animation or a transition between my slide, it's just a fade in, fade out really quick or something like that. Um, again, all of that distraction stuff um, can certainly uh, affect um, how your viewer is perceiving the information. Okay, let's move on to golden rule number two. No more bullets. Now, I'm sure I've just annoyed or lost somebody in my audience, and I was, I'm guilty of it too. But we overuse bullet points in our presentations. Everyone is guilty of it. And we really need to avoid or at least limit when we are using bullets in our presentations. Um, because bullets create all sorts of problems, and it, lots of times it, it is reading or visual perception kind of problems. So <clears throat> let's take a look at a typical slide. So here we have a typical slide form format here on slide number 23. So I got a title at the top and a generic image on the right hand side. But here's why bullet points are not always the greatest thing to use. Bullet points are often fragments of sentences. That's bad. They take up all the space and they leave less room for images. That's also bad. They make you more likely to read the slides. So all I'm doing is reading those this slide to you. That's very bad. And if you're reading this faster than I'm saying it out loud, so you A, got this information before me, or B, are not listening to me anymore because you can't read and listen at the same time for that long, that's really, really very bad. Uh, so again, bullet points, why they can, they can be concise and, and they, can, they can summarize a thought, um, oftentimes are more problems than they're worth. So definitely use those bullet points in a much more sparing way especially when you're presenting the information to the, to, uh, the group. Because, um, again, the students are going to have a tendency to just read the bullet points rather than listen to you and be in reinforced with the information uh, on the screen. So what's the research say about that? Um, well, um, the research says that subjects who were exposed to graphical representations of a concept or a strategy paid significantly more attention to and agreed with and recalled that uh, information better than just a textual um, uh, version or a bulleted list. Um, so 
uh, again. And not only that, but they liked the presenter more when the presenter didn't use bullets. <laughs> I made that one up at the bottom. Uh, but truly, if you can if you can get a much more visual representation of information and not just a textual list, um, then you're going to get more comprehension and better recall. Okay, let's move on to uh, golden rule number three. Um, this is a really common one. This one's not any sort of new information, but keep your information to one point per slide mostly. Um, you're going to improve learning. You're going to improve intention, uh, attention if uh, you keep your presentation to one point per slide um, with those cues highlighting the key material. Um, so again, um, it is important to do that. And also, when we're talking about that, the color and your font size is important to emphasize key points. Um, so you can use color and you can use font size to really emphasize the key pieces of information on that slide. But don't rely on color to convey meaning. I want you to take a look at this slide for a second. You see what I did here? I've made the meaning of the information on the slide reliant on color. And let's all remember that red, green colorblindness is the most common. And so you are going to certainly have some students that don't see color the same way as everybody else. And so you can certainly use color in your um, presentation, and you can even use that color to cue and highlight important things, but try to avoid using color to convey meaning. Tell that to every stoplight on earth, right? Okay. <clears throat> Moving on. Um, but here's the key thing. You can break uh, the one point per slide rule if you need to. And you certainly are going to need to sometimes when it comes to introduction slides or summary slides or comparison slides where you're uh, comparing and contrasting things. I was a science teacher. I was constantly making comparisons in my curriculum. So obviously, I can't have one point per slide in that kind of situation. Um, anytime that you have slides that require stacking um, or things like that, or summaries, um, you can break that rule, but just be cognizant of it. Okay. Golden rule number four, big, fresh fonts. Use big, fresh fonts. So let's talk about fonts for a second and when you use different styles of fonts. Okay, so first of all, we have serif fonts. So serif fonts are fonts like Times New Roman, for example. They're traditional, they're formal, and they're best suited for print. So if you're going to print something on paper, stick with serif fonts. All right, next. We have sans serif fonts. Now, sans serif fonts are those more kind of straight lined fonts. Arial is a good example of that. Railway, which is the font that I use for this slide deck. So the, 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 the font that I use is Railway. That is a really highly accessible, clean font. Um, it's more modern, they're less formal, and they are best for digital presentations. So keep your digital content in those sans serif font styles. Next, we have script. So the script fonts, like brush script, um, resemble handwriting. And they're best for stuff that you don't do at school, to be perfectly honest for you. You should seriously, seriously limit script fonts in your content. Um, they are a much more informal kind of um, content. Um, they're used more um, uh, for decorative things, um, not necessarily content. Uh, areas um, and and so forth. So um, you know, keep the script fonts to a minimum. And then lastly, we have decorative and just like script, they're much more informal. They're used to accent things, but certainly not intended for regular use. They're great for your titles, 
uh, but certainly not um, great for your text uh, content areas on the slide. Okay, uh, on slide number 31, I've got some um, font resources for you. So I've got the font squirrel um, and then just the Google uh, font site. So remember, you can install uh, fonts within Google Slides uh, very, very easily. Uh, in fact, when you're in Google Slides, um, you can just simply go to the font drop down menu uh, and click on more fonts and it will take you to a very large listing of fonts where you can add them to your current list. Um, so um, again, um, hopefully that provides you though some guidance on when to use those different styles of fonts. Also, speaking of font, size matters. Size is important. So what you see on screen um, here, and let me just highlight the text so you know where I am on screen. So right here on screen, that is font size 24. So if you need font smaller than 24, then there's too much information on that slide. Now I'll be the first to admit, I break this rule constantly uh, because 24, I, I just can't get as much information as I want using uh, font uh, size 24. But it's something that I keep in mind way more than I used to. And so I am now getting to a point where I am increasing my font size a little bit um, and I'm just spreading it out over more slides rather than jamming a bunch of text uh, onto uh, the slide itself. And that's really where we're going next. OK, now it's not just the text. It's what you put the text on. So. Let's think about that. Let's think about backgrounds for a second. So if you take a look here, so reading black text against a white background can be problematic for people with dyslexia, migraine conditions, other sorts of neurological um, conditions. So oftentimes what I do is instead of using black on a white background, I'll use a darker shade um, of gray, um, but that can certainly help kind of soften that text a little bit. Um, or I will put, I, I will find that kind of darker shade of text and put it on a more pale pastel background rather than a white background. Again, just easier on the eyes. And not just those students with those types of conditions. Everybody can benefit from this, including you who are staring at the screen all day long, for sure. Next. Be aware of what a dark background and a light background, how it can affect the text. So that shade of the background can really significantly affect the readability of text. Now, this is not only to consider yourself as the teacher. This is also important for you to convey to your students for when they're creating presentations to give to you or to the class. Um, so many times I would have conversations with my students about uh, backgrounds that were too busy or too dark or too light and to, to, to remember that it's the information on the slide that's important, not the fancy background um, that you think looks great when you're designing it, but really affects the overall message uh, being um, portrayed on screen. And then lastly, there's color. And this one, if you're looking at this uh, uh, screen, this might mess with your eyes because that, that middle section there really messes with my eyes as I look at it. Um, remember, red and green color brought uh, blindness is the most common. Um, and so if one shade is not significantly lighter, uh, uh, is not significantly lighter than the other, the colors can be indistinguishable. So make sure there's a high contrast between those options. That middle one, if the colors appear to fight with each other, then that can be super uncomfortable to read. And that's why that pink and that blue, they fight with each other on screen. And I don't even want to read that. Um, and then Bright colors that are in close tones with each other can also can uh, can also be difficult to read, especially when you're looking at a screen. So again, um, you just want to avoid those clashing kinds of colors. And I'm going to get off the screen as quickly as I can. Okay. Um, lastly, golden rule number five. 
generally use less text on the screen and use more pictures. So less text, more pictures. So tell me, what are you going to remember more? So take a look at my screen right now. Are you going to remember a bunch of orange colored words on the screen? Are you going to remember the angry uh, frog that looks like an avocado? Because my guess is you're probably going to remember the angry av avocado frog more than any word that you saw on this screen right now. If you want to learn more about ugly frogs, the picture is a link and it will take you to the ugliest frogs on earth, which happen to be the cutest in my estimation. Okay, now, but speaking of that, just let's talk about the research and let's talk about some statistics here. So first and foremost, every second on the planet, 350 digital slide presentations are given. So uh, 350 slide presentations per second worldwide. People remember about 10% of what they hear. So if you're only listening to me right now, you're going to remember a grand total of 10%, maybe, of the things that I'm saying. But people uh, can retain up to 65% of what they hear and see. So use more pictures and more graphics in your presentations and less words. Um, so again, always back up that textual information with visuals. Relevant images help people learn. So learning is always improved when words are near um, narration or visuals uh, that occur simultaneously with that. So always make sure that your words are next to those visuals that reinforce that information for sure. Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're doing great. So we've got about 10 minutes left here. And I've got some great digital resources to share with you. So how are you going to do all this? So you've got some great apps and tools and extensions and software out there that can be super, super helpful for you to better create accessible content. Now, I wish I could claim that I found all of these re uh, resources and did this research, but I did not. This list of resources comes from Patricia Ferris, who is one of our LTC instructional coaches, who is just awesome. And she has uh, worked really closely with students and with teachers to develop this list. So um, this is a great list of information and just a big special thank you to, to, Patric for, uh, to Patricia for developing it for us. Um, Okay, so let's go down next to slide number 42 here on our slide deck. Um, so what I've got for you is all of the accessibility features of the big three. So we're talking about um, uh, Google Chrome, we're talking about the Microsoft tools, and we're talking about um, iPad. So we've got Apple, Google, and Microsoft here. And each one of these is a link to a slide deck created by Patricia to go over all of the accessibility features of those tools. So we've got all of the Chrome accessibility features here in a slide deck. We've got all of the uh, Microsoft uh, and Windows accessibility features um, in one slide deck. And then we've got Apple and specifically iPad uh, accessibility features. So if you are using Chromebooks with students, take a look at the Chrome. If you're a Microsoft school and you're using the uh, 365 uh, suite, um, take a look at the Microsoft information. And if you're using iPads with your students, take a look at those iPad accessibility features. It's definitely worth your, your while and you're going to find great information there. Okay, now let's talk about some great extensions. So these are some great Chrome extensions um, that will certainly improve um, accessibility uh, of your digital content. Um, and so each one of these um, logos is a link to that corresponding uh, tool. Um, and we're gonna come down and talk, to you, talk about each one individually. So let's talk about Cami first. Now, the way that I have these slides set up is that I've got uh, a link uh, to the Chrome extension right there on the logo. Um, and, and then I have a video specifically about that tool. So again, watch those videos, go to these, uh, uh, go to go to the home pages uh, on the Chrome web store and take a look at these extensions uh, and see if it's something that's going to work for you. Our first one here is Cami. 
I love Cami so much. It's a great annotation tool. Um, it is uh, just a, an amazing annotator where you can, uh, um, you know, add text boxes to PDFs. Um, there's a digital whiteboard feature built in. Um, what's also great about it is you can take PDF documents and split them and merge them together. Um, it's got uh, text to talk to text. So it has voice recognition to text. It has uh, type to talk um, and it has LMS integration. So if you're using um, Canvas or if you're using Google Classroom or you're using Schoology uh, as your learning management system, um, it has that seamless integration with those tools. So uh, Cami is great. There's a free version. Uh, there's a subscription version. Lots of districts have Cami licenses. Um, and there's even a link here on this sl uh, slide to get four months for free if you follow that link. Um, so again, um, check out the video. If you're already using Cami, you might not be aware of features that it has built in. Um, so again, check it out, learn more, but use these resources after our session today um, for all of these uh, great, great tools. Okay, next we have Moat. I love Moat so much. I use it a lot. Uh, Moat, um, what it does is it allows you to create voice um, comments and voice notes. Um, so uh, it has great Google, um, the, the Google Workspace integration. So what it allows you to do is you can drop in voice notes on a Google Doc. So if, if, a student, if students have turned in a Google Doc, you can drop voice note, voice comments in. If you're using Google Forms, Google Forms is great. So the, here's a major problem that teachers encounter with Google Forms to create assessments. And that is, if you have students with an IEP that require that students uh, have their assessments read to them, that creates a problem for digital assessments. What's great is now you can use Moat and you can then take a voice clip of you reading that a question and drop it right into the question itself. So now if you have students that receive accommodations where the test or quiz is read to them, you can use Moat to actually put audio clips of those questions and answers into the Google form itself. Uh, and it has translation built in as well. So a great, great Chrome extension um, that allows you to just create these really nice um, audio clips um, that you can drop into all of your uh, Google tools. Uh, Talk and Comment is another great um, um, voice note maker. Um, and it uh, allows you to create voice notes. It allows you to drop them into Google Docs. Um, it has Google Classroom integration. Um, and it's just a, a great secondary tool. Moat and Talk and Comment are similar tools. Um, and it, it really is excellent and, and definitely worth checking out for sure. Um, Helper Bird is another great one. And so um, Helper Bird is an immersive reader. Um, so um, what it does is it works with doc slides, uh, works on web pages and PDFs. Um, and so that allows you uh, to um, just have a great uh, screen reader. Um, and um, it's specifically um, geared for individuals with dyslexia. Um, so certainly worth uh, checking out and just watch those videos and you can get all of the gist of what these tools do specifically. We just don't have the time to go over them one by one. Uh, Wakelet is outstanding. Oh my gosh, I love Wakelet so much. Um, such a great way to gather information. Um, it uh, uh, is this um, excellent immersive reader um, and just allows you to curate digital content in a really logical and simple way. Um, I use it quite a lot when curating information for workshops that I'm pushing out to my attendees. Um, so um, you can just create, uh, um, you can add images, PDFs, um, you, it has Google Drive and, uh, and, um, and OneDrive integration. Uh, and it's a great way for you to differentiate learning uh, and differentiate information uh, in a logical way. Um, and again, just uh, click on um, that uh, 
uh, image there on the right, and that will take you to all of the information you need about Wakelet. But again, um, such an amazing tool and, and so simple to use and free. Uh, read and write is really good tool. It's, a, it's another great uh, uh, annotation tool. Um, it is, has a great accessibility toolbar. Um, and so you can see here that I have a, 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 a screen capture of that toolbar. And it just has so many great features, translation, screenshot reader. Um, you can hover over text and it'll read it. Um, so it is fantastic. It's free for teachers. I have a form here. And so if you are in K-12, um, you can use it for free. Um, and it is so, so good. And again, similar to Kami in structure. Okay, now a few other Chrome extensions um, that are Google specific, I have here on slide number 50. Um, so um, if you install the carrot browsing uh, tool that, and these are all Google um, um, centric um, uh, extensions here, you can use your keyboard to navigate a web page. So that's fantastic. And, and again, if you do have students that have dexterity issues and have that struggle with a mouse or a trackpad, use the carrot browsing. Um, the color enhancers allows you to create brighter contrast. Um, high contrast is, a, is another great tool. And that's a Chrome extension. That's, or that's a Chrome feature that's built right into your Chromebook. Um, you have long descriptions in the context menu. So this, what this allows you to do is to identify images that have those long descriptions. It shows those long descriptions. And block site is really good where it helps you block out websites that will keep uh, students focused. So again, these are all just excellent native Google uh, apps that are outstanding and they will work seamlessly in your workspace. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of really great websites to check out are Common Lit, Flipgrid, now called just Flip, uh, and Desmos. And if you're a math teacher, you're probably using Desmos, I hope. Um, let's talk about Common Lit first. So Common Lit is a great um, translation annotation uh, tool. Um, and so it's just so, so good. Uh, it has this guided mode that will uh, get students working through text. So um, certainly outstanding for you reading teachers, uh, for you ELA teachers, uh, for sure. Uh, Common Lit is such an amazing tool. Um, now, Flip is another um, video tool. Um, it allows you to create uh, and exchange uh, simple videos back and forth with your students. Captioning's built in. There's an immersive reader built in. It will create, it'll auto generate transcripts. Um, it is uh, excellent for those students um, in the deaf and hard, and, and the hard of hearing community uh, and those students that have cognitive uh, uh, development issues for sure. Um, I love Flip so much. It's just a great little tool um, to create just awesome little interactive videos that you can exchange back and forth with your students. And then we have Desmos, and uh, Desmos is outstanding uh, for you uh, math teachers. Um, it is a great digital math platform that allows you to interact and engage mathematical concepts with your students. Um, you know as well as I do, math digital curriculum can be super tricky for sure. Um, so Desmos has a screen reader built in. It has a uh, captioning built in. Um, uh, it has a, even a braille and a keyboard integration um, and also text-to-speech. So um, for you math teachers that are really struggling to find great digital uh, curriculum tools, Desmos is one that you should definitely check out. Um, and just, again, like I said, use these resources that are on the slide. Uh, just click on the pictures and they'll take you to everything you need to know. Okay, that takes us to the end. I'm about uh, five minutes to go, so I can take some questions and answers. Um, that guy right there, that's the inventor of the internet. That's Tim Berners-Lee. Um, he is literally the man who invented the internet. Uh, he was at the very beginning uh, stages of the World Wide Web. He is the director of the WC3, um, uh, and he uh, has devoted his career now 
to web accessibility. Uh, and so he runs the, the website accessibility initiative. Um, so again, um, uh, the power of the web is in its universality. Um, access to everyone, regardless of disability, is the most access, uh, essential aspect of it. So um, take it from him for sure.